Okay, so what we're going to work on today is a little bit get ready for our um, computer assignment. And then if we have time, we're going to do uh, a couple quick examples of things um, that might be relevant to you. So, yeah. Ah, if you multiply two functions together. So, for example, on the, so that's a great question. On the assignment, I'm asking you to multiply two functions together, right? One of them is, um, you want to do part A or part B? Right, part A. Hey, so what are the functions I ask you to multiply? Cosine of, Cosine of what? Uh, anything we choose as long as you said you recommend multiple. Integer multiples. Yeah. Okay. So just for the sake of argument, let's say um, cosine of 2 pi t and sine of pi t. So that's a great question. So let's do this. Let's actually go and um, plot those. So let's see, t is, so I'm going to show you how you can answer this question for yourself, in other words. So I don't know, let's make a time vector, I don't know, 20 seconds might be enough. Let's do 5, okay. So we'll say x equals cosine 2 pi t, y equals sine pi t, and z, uh, z equals x dot times y. Your figure plot t comma z, where z is their product. Okay. Actually, let me do this real quick. Um, let's plot them individually. Subplot two one one. Plot t comma x comma t comma y. Subplot two one two. Okay. So the top plot is the cosine and the sine plotted on the same axes. Can you see them? I don't know, maybe we can, let's have a look here. So the blue one is the cosine with the higher frequency, right? It should have a frequency of two pi radians per second, which is one hertz, which is one cycle per second. And in fact, you can see your cosine, the, which is the blue signal up top, has a period of one second. The green signal is the sine wave, which is pi T, which means it has frequency of pi radians per second, which is half a hertz, which is two seconds per period. And if you look at the green signal, you can see that, in fact, it takes two seconds to repeat itself. And now in the bottom plot, what I've done is I've multiplied them. So tell me, what's the product? What is the period of their product? No, look at the picture and tell me. Don't, don't, don't guess. Right, that's why I drew the picture. <laughs> well, I mean, let's just start by getting a number, okay, and then we can answer. Let me put a, let's put a grid on here. Grid. Which one, the green one? It's hard to see. How would I do this? Boop. You see that? All right. All right. Okay. Well, all we're going to do today is talk about graphics. So we'll, we'll cover making pretty pictures today. Okay. So if you look at the bottom plot, it looks to me like the period is two seconds. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. So could we have guessed that two? So the short answer to your question is, if that, that was the two functions you picked, when you multiply them and you get the Fourier transform of the product, you, it's going to have a period of two seconds. That's your answer. So a more interesting question is, could we have predicted that without <laughs> plotting it? Yes. Well, I should hope so. What if I did uh, cosine 2 pi t and cosine 1.5 t? Now what do I got? Hold on, let me make all the plots dark real quick. Set, find object, get current figure, type, line, line width, two. Oops. There you go. You don't learn that on the first day. Okay, so now I've changed it slightly so that my, um, uh, 
So now we're doing, I kept the first one the same. The second one is now 1.5 pi t. So that's got a period of 1.5 pi, which is 2 pi f. So therefore, f equals what? 3 quarters hertz, which means the period is 4 thirds seconds. And this period we said is 1 second. Okay, so are we seeing that in the top plot? Well, the blue one didn't change. That one still has a period of one second. Does the green one have a period of uh, <laughs> four-thirds seconds? It's a fair question, right? Say that again. So I, the signal, I changed my problem slightly. Before I was doing sine of pi t. Now I'm doing sine of 1.5 pi t. So I calculated the frequency is 1.5 rads per second, and that means the frequency in hertz is 3 quarters, which means the period is 4 thirds seconds. So does it look right that the cosine, that the sinusoid has a frequency of, uh, has a period of 4 thirds seconds? I don't know. Here. Yeah. Because it's like a little bigger than 1, but less than 2. How can I know for sure? A marker. There you go. Put a marker. So if I'm going to put a marker right here, I'm going to keep adjusting that marker till it read the y value equals zero. We're pretty darn close to it. And what's my corresponding <laughs> x value? Four thirds. So that's good. So that at least makes sense. So now let's come down here and look at the uh, their product. What is the frequency of their product? The period of their product? It's definitely more than four thirds, right? Because it looks like, like here's here's a peak. And here's a peak. So that one is at about 3. This one's at about 7. So it looks like their product now has a, free, has a period of 4 seconds. Could we have predicted that? Okay, here's how I think we could have predicted that. So... Let's start at time zero. Okay, so after one second, the cosine has completed a cycle. Okay, so the cosine completes a cycle every every second. So each little hash mark is where the cosine completes a second. Now let's look at the sinusoid. So the sinusoid finishes its first period after four thirds of a second. And it finishes its second period after what time? Eight thirds, which is, is that two and two thirds? Yes, it is. And it finishes its third period at four seconds. So, does it, can you see how if you wait, like in the beginning, both of them were lined up, right? Both of them were at the beginning of one period. You have to wait a full four seconds before they fully line up again. <coughs> okay, and if you're multiplying them together, that's when it'll start re the product will start repeating itself again. It's like when they start lining up. So, it's the, what is it? Is that the least common multiple or the? Yeah, that's it. Is that the, the least common multiple? Okay. So, that's what I've done. So, yeah, that's how you can figure out. And that's the period that you, you would use. In calculating that. Okay, so let me pull up the um, the computer assignment and tell you what I think are the most important things that you should have already looked at. Oops, wrong folder. I'd be happy to. Um, oh, hold on a second. Computer assignment one dot PDF. Back to my code. Yes. Ask questions about the code. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to see for some reason it's not, uh, not plotting and uh, saying uh, something about my lens space. Did you do your lens space like mine? Yeah, it looks pretty similar. Yeah. Hmm. Did you do the dot? Yeah, the, the point, the point yeah, multiply? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Lin space, not line space. Yeah. There's also log space in case anybody cares. Uh, but we'll talk more about that when the time comes, if ever. 
Okay, so back to this thing. So I'm giving. So first of all, this is due two weeks from today or one week. One week. Ah! Okay. Time is of the essence. No, I ain't extending it. This is it. <laughs> We're on a schedule, baby. We got five of these to do. We got exams. It's all, you know, this is all organized this way on purpose so that nothing overlaps. Um, okay, so <clears throat> part one. You take a cosine and a sine with frequencies of your choosing. You multiply them together. Okay? So here's what I'm looking for. Um, in both part, part one and part two of this assignment, I want this. I'm giving you two functions that I want you to multiply. So let's say I call one of those functions x of t and one of those functions y of t. Okay? So here's, I, in both cases, here's what I want. I want you to give me... This is what the Fourier transform of x of t looks like. What do I mean when I say, first of all, what do I mean when I say Fourier transform? Frequency. The frequency content. You remember how in class we plotted like the magnitude of a sub n versus frequency? We did that, in, I posted example code for that on Monday for the sawtooth signal. The yeah, the frequency response. Okay. Um, so you do that for x. You do the same thing for y. And then you do a third one for x times y. And then you scratch your head and you say, I see a pattern. And you tell me what the pattern is. You with me? There's a pattern. In other words, um, you're going to go to a lot of work. What you're going to take x times y, then you're going to do like a page of calculus to figure out what a sub n is for their product. But wouldn't it be nice if in fact there was a pattern, what that would mean was that if you knew what the Fourier transform of x was, and you knew what the Fourier transform of y was, and if in fact there was a pattern for what happens when you multiply those functions together, then you wouldn't need to do all that math. You would just know how to combine those Fourier transforms together to figure out what the Fourier of the product looks like. That's the goal of this project. Convolution. Uh, yeah, sort of. It's, 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 it smells like convolution. It is, it's convolution in the frequency domain, not in the time domain. But I don't want anyone to get bent over. You know, we're not, no. We'll teach convolution when we get there. Like, essentially, I want you to feel convolution, not like... You know, I want you to get a, get a feel for like, just what the pattern looks like. <laughs> we'll put a name and math on it later. Yes? If you, if you have the blue class, right? So you would think that you could know um, the period, amplitude, and of the x times y, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying I want, x time, I want the a sub n for their, you can just do amplitude if you want. You're welcome to do phase as well. But, you know, like let's say, Mm -hmm. the amplitude, the period, and the phase of x times y. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's all there. You do the phase. Well, um, I had a question. Phases, let's say phase is optional. You can get the meat of this with just the amplitude. So it's like if you know the Fourier series of one of the two, you could know. You can deduce theory. this without doing the page worth of calculus. Okay. But for today, for this project, you're going to do the page worth of calculus just so you can... But I mean, you don't have to go there cosine to sine. So Not in the second part. The f in the second part, you're taking a cosine and multiplying it by this rectangular signal. Okay. So what's that going to look like when you multiply those? When you multi I'm in the second part... I'm multiplying cosine 20 pi t with that guy. But then you can't really, I was doing it, and you can't get an equation of a square wave, right? Sure you can. So would you just do a piecewise function from negative infinity to positive infinity? Well, you only have to do it over one period, uh, yeah. right? Because with periodic signals, you only need to do one, one but period. If so, the period does match. Hold on. What's, ah, well, then you have to figure out what's, what's the frequency, what's the period of their product. And that's why we just did that example. 
you have to figure out the period of their product. And that's the period that you use. So you're going to be taking a cosine, multiplying it by this square wave. So that square wave either equals 0 or it equals 1. So when you take your cosine and multiply it by the 0 portions, you get 0. And when you take your cosine and multiply it by the 1 portions, you get, you get the cosine. Why is it shifted? Of course, my eraser is back here. It's kind of cool back here. Period. Well, so essentially what you're telling me is you're going to have cosine 0. Cosine 0. Isn't that right? Yeah. Isn't that what you just told me? Right? When you, for the portions where you multiply by the 1, you get the cosine. And for the portions where you multiply by the 0, you get the 0. Is that a periodic signal? Yeah. Sure. How often does it repeat itself? Every, whatever, however long that is. That's the period. It's not this period. That's not the period. Right, because, you know, if it was that was the period, then I would see this bump over and over and over again. But that's not what I see. But that period is still the period of the cosine. This guy is the period of the cosine, but this period is what? That's the period of the square wave. Yeah. And it might not necessarily be the period of the square wave. You have to check to make sure that twenty pi t lines up with the period of. The Does it? I Oh, God, I hope I did. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> 20 pi t, 2 pi t, 1 10th. Uh, yeah, I think it's good. Oh, rats, unless I did. I think we're good. We, uh, I'll double check when I get upstairs, but I'm pretty sure we're good. Okay. Sometimes you write these things, and you're like, yeah, I got it all right. And then you're like, wait, I screwed it all up. OK. But essentially, that's the thing. So there's a relationship. If you understand what the Fourier transform of two individual functions is, there should be a way of just guessing what the Fourier transform of their product is. And I don't expect you to know what that guess is. right? The whole point of the assignment is to look at the pictures and be like, oh, I see a pattern here. And then in the future, if I gave you two functions to multiply together, you wouldn't have to do all that work. Okay, that's the goal of the assignment. Now, uh, part one is uh, a sine and a cosine. <coughs> part two is a cosine and a square wave. Um, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to do all the math and convince yourself that you understand what the pattern is. And then you have to convince me that you understand what the pattern is. And here's how you're going to do that. Um, you're going to write a report. And it's going to be a short report. Um, I'm limiting you to, did I say how many? Two pages maximum. Now. Um, I am going to ask you to follow a strict formula, and this is like kind of a big thing for me. This is a part of the course that I've developed over the last few years, and it, it sort of came from a place of frustration. Um, I would have, used to have students do these assignments, and I wouldn't really specify what they would hand in, and I would get in all sorts of garbage. Like people would just hand in um, like three pages of awful, awful calculus. It's like all erasure marks, and I can't tell what's going on, and it's smudged, and then like some lousy screenshot of a MATLAB plot that I can't read, and like I'm supposed to grade that. So what I decided is you're going to write a report. And it doesn't have to be long, but it does have to be clear. Okay? So, and I'm not going to tell you what to put in the report. Okay? The whole point of this is we're going to practice technical communication. So you have to stop and think, what do I need to say to convince my instructor that I understood this assignment? Okay, you know what I want you to find out. I want you to understand the relationship of like what happens when you multiply these functions together. So I want you to convince me that you understand this relationship. What you choose to write to convince me is your, you know, that's up to you. You could use equations, you could use tables, you could use figures. You could use words. Well, you're definitely going to use words, OK? Um, but uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not stipulating that you, know, you have to answer these five questions. Like, you just have to convince me you understood the assignment. And sort of, um, you know, I think I have like a few questions that I, that I um, put in the text. But here's the really tricky part. 
I am requiring that you follow. Has anybody ever seen this? Okay, so this is, um, if you've ever read an article that's been published by IEEE, which is the Professional Society for Electrical Engineers, they always have a certain look and feel to it. Okay, it's always in this two-column format, same font, same margin, same everything, same everything, right? It's a standard format. I want you to follow the standard format. Because it makes these things, first of all, they look really professional and you can really like hang your hat on it and say like, hey, I can produce a professional engineering document. Okay. Secondly, it's easier for me to read. Um, now, here's what you do. This, this <laughs> file, IEEE template.doc, has already been uploaded to Blackboard. Here's what you do to make your, your article look clean like this one. You download this file. You make a copy of it so you keep the template you know, for later. And then you edit it. Right? Don't, you don't have to worry about making the margins or the fonts or anything. Right? You just come along and you say, um, you know, effect of multiplying two functions. Okay? Then you come and you put your names in here. You can work in groups of two. Right? I obeyed okay, uh, J. Steinberg so on and so forth. Okay, you just edit it and it's done, right? Could it be any easier than that? Don't mess with the margins, don't mess with the fonts, don't think your font looks prettier, it does not look prettier, okay? Just keep it the way it is. Uh, every semester I have somebody who's like, you know it would be really nice is if we use Palatino instead of, I'm like, no. Um, We can talk about it if you, you know, as you have those problems. But, okay, you don't need to worry about, like, index terms. That's just something for, like, papers. You can erase index terms. But a set, uh, an abstract of a couple sentences would be nice. Uh, introduction, methods, results, discussion. You know, I think it's sort of like the bare minimum you can get away with. Um, you don't have to put all this nonsense down here about when the manuscript was received. You can delete that, too. Um, but you can see how it's got like major headings, so section one, introduction, section two, procedure, and then you have minor headings, A, review stage, B, final, whatever. Like you can rename them, but it's all fonts, margins, tab, it's all done for you. It's already on Blackboard. Okay, now let's talk about graphs. This is an easy graph to read. Okay, you will provide me with graphs that are easy to read. So this is a big deal. I want, I want to talk, uh, maybe even spend the, the remaining 20 minutes of lecture just on talking about making graphs that are easy to read. I'm going to try to give you some do's and don'ts. So you go to Blackboard and um, you create a plot. So um, let's start with my plot like this. So I'm going to, um, all I have to do is click in the figure. If I come up to the file, well, let's see, the, there should be a <coughs> copy figure. I can go back to Word. Well, let's see how they've done this. Hold on just a second. And I should be able to, oh dear. That didn't look good at all, did it? Yeah, I think that, that, that trick I did might actually work in uh, Windows, not on Mac. Um, so the, the method I've had the most luck with is um, click in the figure window, save as, and just save it as a, um, like a JPEG or something. What you did to work, it would have to be in the figure tab. I, I, no, 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 I was in the figure tab, wasn't I? I like clicked, okay, so you're saying if I click here. Copy figure. So you're saying now it should work? Nope. That was worth a try. Okay, so if that doesn't work for some reason, you can uh, do a save as, save it as some sort of graphics file that you're friendly with, okay, and then you come over here. Um, let's 
let's see here. Just groups? Is that what the deal is? Nope. So I'm just going to erase that. And now I'm going to insert picture from file. And there we go. Okay, now, what do you think of my graphic? Is this a good figure? No. 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 What are like at least seven things that suck about it? Too sm what's too small? You're right, but what do I, what, what, what specifically, what's too small? Can you read any of the numbers? No. And guess what? Neither can I. Okay, and that's a problem. You need to make your numbers bigger to read. Okay, what else, uh, what else stands to be improved about this? No labels. Okay, I don't know what's on your x-axis. Is it seconds? Is it milliseconds? Is it hertz? Okay, is it days of the week? I don't know. I don't know, and I don't feel like guessing. Okay, what else, what else could, could, could be improved? Could have a title on it. So you actually, so one thing you need is, you actually don't need a title because you've got a legend. Um, but at the very least, you need to label your X and your Y axes. That, I think, is non-negotiable. All right. Um, what about this top plot? Can we, can we really tell the difference between the blue and the... No. Again, no, we can't. Like, you see how those colors just kind of like mush together? Right, so one thing I could do is, instead of trying to pack in like 20 seconds worth of time and like a whole bunch of periods that just kind of squash on top of each other, maybe I'll say, I only need to run this from zero to five seconds, okay, and then it can be more spread out and I'll be able to see that better. But either way, I have a lot of options, okay. Um, very quickly, while I'm noticing it, you can see that the, the figure always has a legend. The legend tells you what's going on in the picture. Once you do this, from the text, you don't refer to that picture up there in the corner. You refer to figure one. Okay? It's a lot more professional than saying the picture on the previous page, not the first one, the one underneath it. Okay? Like, you just say figure one. And, every, and it sounds dumb, like you're laughing, but you think about what a lot of difference that makes in, in like how professional a document is. So let's talk about how MATLAB can be used to, uh, to clean some of this stuff up. So first of all, I really like the suggestion about uh, like running this for less time. So let's maybe run this out to uh, 10 seconds. It's a little bit better. All right, let's put some labels on this. So I've used the subplot commands. You don't have to use the subplot commands, but I, you know, I like them. They're, they're useful sometimes. Uh, let's put a legend, uh, uh, a label on here. So... Um, I'm going to, there's one of two ways. I'll show you both ways of doing it. One way of applying a label is to use the xlabel command. So it's xlabel, open paren, single quote, time in seconds. And now you can see I've got time in seconds. The other way I could do it, if I don't feel like typing it, so first of all, you can see that we're, it, it put the label underneath the first axis. And the reason it did that was that the subplot command activated that axis. So now everything I do is only going to be relevant for that axis. So any labels, any titles, any anything. If I want the same thing for the second plot, then I have to reissue that command to also occur for subplot 2. Let me take that out real quick. So if you don't like typing stuff in, the other option you have, you see how you have this little arrow in your figure window? That lets you edit the figure. So I'm going to come down here, and I can, um, let's see. I should be able to double click. Let's see, more properties. And you get a whole, please tell me that property is. Huh. I'm not able to edit that from here. Uh, you did it on your side? Yeah. That's weird. It's not letting me do it over here. Uh, that's fascinating. Okay. Well, in any event, so let me put, go ahead and put in my X label and my Y label. We'll, we'll, we'll do some editing in a second. So Y label. There was like a small line. It was like really, really small. All right. 
So there's X. Okay. So here's an edit we can do. What do you think about my font sizes? Small. Definitely too small. So I'm going to double click on, uh, actually, if I uh, right click on where it says time, look at all these things I can change. Um, I didn't make it any bigger. Hold on. Oh, now it's there. I can double click on it and edit it. I want to change, let's see, I can change the color. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but that's even worse. Even worse. Um, font, there we go. Okay, I'm going to make a 24 point bold italics. I don't know, whatever floats your boat. Uh, for some reason, the italics isn't working. I'm not going to worry about it. All sorts of stuff is like wonky on a Mac, but okay. See how it got nice and big? Good. I'm going to do the same thing over here with my y-axis label. Uh, font, 24 point bold. Okay. Would uh, the grid be suitable here? Grid would be totally <laughs> suitable. Right click on the axis, give me a grid. <laughs> if you don't like that, so everything I'm doing by pointing and clicking in the figure window, you can also do the same thing with the text command. So I could come here and say grid on, and that would also turn on the um, that also turn on the grid. Um, my axis numbers are too small. Same thing. I'm going to right click on the axis, select font. I'd like 18 point. Maybe I want to make it bold. Okay, even I can read that. What about my lines? Do you like the colors? I hate the colors. Oops. Um, we can do it in a couple ways. Um, let's try. I'm going to right click on my blue line. Uh, I'd like my width to be 2. I'd like my, you know, if I can make it dashed, if I'm into that sort of thing, which I'm not. Um, we can talk about markers. Um, what a marker will do is at every point it will mark it with a, like an X or a circle or whatever. But in this case, it's not going to really make much sense because I have so many points. I have like 10,000 points there, so it's going to draw a circle over every, 10, 000, you know, over every one of those 10,000 points, which isn't really all that helpful to me. Uh, but in some cases, we have sparser data that might be helpful. Um, so let me go ahead and take out my marker. Let's go ahead and make the green, the green one um, heavier. And... Um, you know what else I don't like? I don't like that it decided to number my axis 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. I want to number it by 1s. Right, what's up with that? Okay, I'm going to right click on that axis. Uh, let's see here. I think I want to do property editor. Yeah, I'm just trying to... There we go. Ah... Okay, 0 to 10, ticks. I would like, right now it's auto-ticking. I would like to step my ticks by 1. Apply. Okay, did it do it? Oh, maybe it was on the wrong axis. There we go, x-axis. Ticks, step by 1, apply, okay. So it's all editable. It's good, right? Let me show you another uh, cool feature. I'm going to right click in that axis, show legend. Edit the legend. Uh, X of T, Y of T. You know what's cool about your legend? If I come along, and change the green signal to, I don't know, let's pick something really awful. Yellow. Yellow. Let's be invisible to man. How about, um, oh, I don't know, purple. Not like that's any better. Purple haze. Purple haze. Okay, the legend changes as well. You can basically change everything. You can even change the background color. If you don't like the white, you can change the white. So you got a lot of choices there. 
Okay. Um, anyway, once you've got it dialed the way you want, now let's try bring, bringing that into um, back into Word. So I'm going to save as portable networks graphic untitled. Yes, feel free to overwrite the old one. Uh, back to Word. Erase that. Put in a new picture. And you can see I still have my old ass data there. Okay. Is that better? Totally. Totally better. Okay. So what I want you to do is, now, and then you're going to print it out, and maybe you don't like it. I mean, don't, don't lose your mind over it, but I mean, you can definitely put in some thought into your optics here. So all sorts of things to think about. You know, are you displaying an appropriate amount of time? Right? Like you've displayed 10 seconds. Is 10 a good number? Would 20 be better? Would 5 be better? If I've got multiple plots, let me show you one that people do sometimes, which drives me bananas. Um, what uh, if, let me just do this. So. <coughs> so here's a pet peeve. What do you think of this plot? Top plot goes 0 to 10. Second plot goes 0 to 4. So presumably, if you're showing me two plots stacked on top of each other, there's got to be a relationship between them, right? Like, I'm looking at that, and I'm going to assume that there's somehow a relationship that I'm supposed to draw between the two of them because they're in the same figure, and they're lined up on top of each other. And now, you went and you changed it. So one is 0 to 10, and one is 0 to 4. And now that's just confusing to me. Maybe there's a good reason for you to do that. Like, I don't want to make some sort of blanket statement, like, never do this. But give some thought to it. If I'm supposed to be comparing the top plot to the bottom plot, and that's part of my analysis, make it easy for me. Put them on the same axis. OK? Here's another one that drives me bananas. Um, put that back to that. Um, Why is that going to drive me nuts? Yeah, the, like the y-axis ranges are different. Top one is minus 1 to 1. Bottom one is minus 3 to 3. Okay, so again, like if the point of those two plots is to indicate to me that something changed, that the bottom plot is, like I amplified my signal. And look, if you look at the bottom plot, you can see that it's been amplified relative to the top signal. If that's what you're trying to show me, put them on the same axis, right? Because otherwise, how am I going to be able to tell that the top one is, you know, the bottom one is three times bigger than the top one? Maybe that's not relevant to your plot. Like, if it's not relevant, it's not relevant. Like, don't, you know, don't, don't sweat that it's not like some hard and fast rule that they always need to be the same. But if you're trying to demonstrate a relationship between the top plot and the bottom plot, then it, you might want to think about having them be the same range. Yes? If we have two plots in one figure, how should we refer to, uh, to you know, those plots in the paper? Should we say graph A and figure one or graph B? Oh, like if you have a top one and a bottom one? Yeah. Um, good question. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I would do. In your case, what I would do is I would, for a title, I would title the top one... Um, I would title the top one A, and I would title the bottom one B. So I would say, um, so subplot or two on one, title A. Okay, and then for the bottom one, I would do B, and that's it. You refer to it to figure one A and one B. Okay. Couldn't be any easier. Yes, that's exactly what that this is. That is the IEEE template for words. Has anybody tried working in LaTeX for word processing? No? Yeah, you see, there's an IEEE uh, template for LaTeX. Feel free to try it. It's awesome. Um, okay. Same thing for your tables, okay? Uh, think about what goes into your tables, organizing data, keeping it easy to read, keeping it meaningful, keeping the columns, like, relevant to each other. Okay, put, you can put thought into this stuff. Um, Trying to think of like pet peeves about figures. Ooh, white space. Here's one that drives me totally bananas. Um, and and you know somebody will do this. 
Okay, so they'll give me a plot. <coughs> Frequency versus, I don't know, magnitude of A sub N. And you'll scale your axis so that, like let's say your plot looks like this. So what's wrong with that plot when you show it to me? The whole plot is empty, right? And I'm going to like try to make sense out of this stuff that you wedged into the corner there. Okay, if you need to zoom in, zoom in. Like, I don't need to see it out to the 400th harmonic. You know, maybe you can make your point just by showing me the first, like, four harmonics and, like, zoom in and I can see what's going on better. So, all sorts of cool stuff going on. What do you think? Yes? Latex? No. no. Template. 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 Yeah. Yeah, they, they have you... Um, Use text boxes for your figures and then put pictures in there. Yeah. Like formatting mm -hmm. So you can't just add pictures. I don't know. You're saying, like, what if you wanted to add another picture? Yeah, no. I, I'm, I'm saying that the new one is. I don't know if you have the latest one. Oh, what happened here? It's, it's online. This one was the latest one. Not This is a text box. Yeah. Yeah, so I've, it's put it in a text. So you're saying that's not the latest version? No, no, that's the way you should get it to do it. Yeah. No, I was just saying. Right, so if you want to add a new figure, what I would do is I would take this existing text box. Right, so for those of you that are, that are like Microsoft Word savvy, the way they do graphics is basically, um, yeah, so you set up something called a text box, which is like this floating entity that sits on top of your text, and then you stick the figure and the legend inside the text box. So if you want to make a new figure, your best bet is to select, <laughs> is to basically copy the existing text box and paste it somewhere else. Okay. And well, yeah, it'll wind up screwing up your formatting, and then I'll be able to tell. It says it within the document itself if you read it. There's, there's also, um, like, you got, it's supposed to be 2007. What's that? Like, when you save it, it's supposed to be the document. Oh, 2007. Okay. Oh, because if you go to DocX, it'll get confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, so you might want to keep it as a doc X, that's, uh, as a doc, that's probably good advice. Um, anyway, have fun. Um, you can do, uh, has anybody messed with equations in Word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, if you have math type, that's a little easier, but whatever, you can make it work. I wrote an entire master's thesis dissertation in Word using like 15-year-old <laughs> Word technology. If I could get it to work, you can too. Um, anyway. So that's that. So, oh, um, yeah, there's like an old way of doing uh, equations, which is like everything you, you drag off of that menu. I don't know if you've ever messed with equations in Word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I mean, it can be a pain in the ass. It is a pain in the ass. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a way to do that. You have to have math type. What's nicer, well, I use um, LibreOffice, but it's Word. So what I did was I math. You can actually type in math type directly, and then I can highlight it, hit a hotkey, and it makes an equation. Okay. I think in the new version of Word, like I'm using Word 2011, mm -hmm. and in mine, I think the, the math type came with it, I believe. So you can actually just, I don't remember exactly how to do it, but there's like a command you say to do insert equation, and then you can just do like, backslash alpha, like you type the word alpha, and then it just automatically changes it into an alpha sign, which is kind of nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. L let me just drop in a couple things before I run out of time. Okay. Now, here's the problem with this. If I quit, if I quit MATLAB now, what's going to happen to this figure? It goes bye-bye. You lose the figure. So, Again, two schools of thought on how to do this. I'm kind of like an old school mentality. I like to, all this stuff that you've seen me doing by clicking around in the file, I prefer to just type the commands in into the, into the file and then save the file. And then that way, I don't care if I lose the figure because I can just always regenerate the figure by rerunning the file. You may not want to do that, and that's totally fine if you don't want to do that. But you do need to save your figure because... You're going to want to come back tomorrow and you'll be like, you know what, purple didn't work for me. I want to try red. Okay. So what you're going to do is, uh, in the same way that we did save as to generate that, that uh, graphics file, you can save it as a uh, MATLAB figure. 
dot fig. Okay, if you do that, then once your figure is closed, you can always come back, <coughs> uh, provided you can find your folder, desktop, untitled.fig, and you get your figure back, and you can edit all the stuff that's in there. All right, I've got three minutes of your time left, and I have to give you one final important piece of information. Okay, it says it right here in the document, but you still it's going to bear repeating. This is how I want you to submit your paper. I don't want you to give me a hard copy. Okay, I won't read it. I want to do everything electronically. I'll grade the electronic version. I'll email you the graded version back. I tried it last semester. It was awesome. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your, uh, your document, your, your paper that you've created. You can either leave it as a Word file or you can create a PDF. I don't care. Take that file. Add to it all, any MATLAB code that you've written. Okay? I may or may not run your code. Like You can't write your paper assuming that I'm going to look at your code. If you want code, me to read code, put a few lines of it in your, in your report. Right? But don't expect that like your report should stand by itself. It shouldn't require that I'm going to go read five pages of code or whatever. But still, I want your code because I might want to run it. So I want you to put everything together in a folder, zip it up, Name the zip file something clever, like the names of your, either if it's you or you and your partner, so obeyedsteinberg.zip, and email me the zip file. All right? And you're going to email it to me at this address, I obeyed plus 3512, that's this class, CA1, that's this computer assignment, at temple.edu. If you do that, everybody's emails will all automatically land in one folder on my email, and I won't have to do any work. And then I'll hit a single keystroke on my laptop, and I will say, go to every email in this directory and pull out all the attachments and unzip them, and it will automatically create a nice directory of things for me to grade, and I won't have to like manually drag and pull, and it makes life a headache. It's, this semester, it's not that big of a deal because there's only like 20 of you, but I've done this course with 60 people, and I can guarantee you it makes my life a lot easier if you do it this way. But So it's a little bit <laughs> anal retentive, but the reality is, is like, I have plenty of professional situations where I have to submit documents and people do care that you dot all the I's and cross all the T's and submit it in exactly the right way and they won't even read it if you don't do it the right way. So be nice to me. All you got to do is zip it and email it. It's that easy. Okay? And you got a week. And come ask questions. Like, we'll have fun. Okay? This is supposed to be a good experience, not like I'm not trying to rake you over the coals. Um, I mean, it's a two-page paper, right? If you want to make it one page, make it one page. Like, I don't, don't feel like you have to fill two pages. I don't want to read any more than I have to. If you can make your points in, two, in one page, do it. Don't give me an extra page of garbage just because you feel like I needed extra work. Thank you. That was fun. I'll see you on.